this morning, amen. And uh, we need Jesus, amen. And Jesus, as a matter of fact, that's who I'm preaching on today. Uh, we're going to have communion next Sunday, and I want to go ahead and get our hearts prepared for that. And uh, I'm going to talk about three things. That th this morning, I'm going to talk about my Jesus, amen. Tonight, I'm going to talk about my Jesus. And Wednesday night, I'm going to talk about my Jesus. Amen. 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 And then next Sunday morning, we're going to talk about my Jesus. Amen. And that's what we're going to do the next four sermons. And uh, we're going to jump out of Zechariah for just a brief moment. And I'm glad I did because when you get focused on, on what the Lord did for us on Calvary, and when you get focused on what Judgment House is really all about, and that's about serving people and reaching people. Amen. Today, this morning, as a matter of fact, this morning I'm going to talk about uh, Jesus having the servant's heart. And uh, he's going to be in the upper room. And then tonight, I'm going to talk about Jesus' surrendered heart. And he's going to be at, he's going to be at Gethsemane. And then Wednesday night, I'm going to talk about Jesus' sacrificial heart. And he's going to be in Golgotha. And those, those things are important as we go into next Sunday morning and we... As we take communion and remembrance of him, his broken body and his blood sacrifice. Then as we go on in the judgment house, by the way, thank you. I know for the next three or four Sundays, y'all are going to be practicing. Uh, well, we're going to be practicing judgment house. Thank you for doing that, for signing up, being a part of that. Because I know, I know that uh, you guys work hard and uh, a lot of you. A lot of you come in here on one wheel, two wheels, three wheels, or even I've seen 18 wheelers out here. It don't matter. Just get here. And uh, I know you work hard. And thank you for working hard in Judgment House. That's going to reach a lot of people. It's going to make the churches stronger. It's going to make uh, the area churches stronger. And uh, God's going God's to use that to bring honor and glory to yourself. But this morning I want to talk about my Jesus. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 13. And I'm going to read some verses this morning down to verse 18. And as you read that this morning, I want you to think about others because that's why Jesus came. It's about others. He never, he never made it about himself. You know, we live in a day and age where, where, let's just be honest, a lot of spiritual leaders, they want to make it about them and about their ministry. Well, it's not their ministry and it's not about them. It's about Jesus and his, and his church, amen? And it's about him and what he did. And what he does. Look down with me this morning. In verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, If I wash, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not except to wash his feet but it's clean everywhere, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So after that he had washed his feet, he had taken his garments, and was set down again, and said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? That's a question. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, 
neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you that do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we come to you, Lord, because we need you. Lord, every person in here needs a work of grace of some kind, including me. And this morning, I want to ask you, Lord, to minister to your people. Lord, there's some come in with, with hurts and needs that only you can take care of. Lord, there's, there's people suffering this morning from financial ruin, suffering from physical, maybe physical abilities. Lord, maybe they're suffering, Lord, from mental or, or emotional uh, things that are going on in their life. Maybe they're suffering from loss. But whatever it is this morning, Lord, you're deeply concerned about. And Lord, if we're concerned about it, how much more you're concerned about it because of your great love. At this morning, I want you to ask you, Lord, to just touch those people that need a touch from you. And Lord, that you'll touch, speak to those who, who need to get things right with you. And Lord, be, be with us all this morning. But Lord, I, I want you to be at their children's ministry, our youth ministry, and divorce care and grief share and all, all the things that go on here. I want you to be in all those, but Judgment House is coming up. Lord, we're excited about it, working in that. We're excited about being together. Most of all, Lord, we're excited to know you're going to see what you're going to do. And Lord, I, I want to lift that all up in your hands this morning. Lord, this is, this, if this is our best day on earth, it's still a good day. But Lord, we look, we look for your return. Lord, when we go home with you, and this morning, Lord, get those ready that are not ready. And Lord, you minister to your people as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. <clears throat> like I said this morning, I'm gonna, I won't talk about my Jesus this morning. And like I said just, just then, just a few minutes ago, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move towards next Sunday morning, observing communion and remembering Jesus' death on the cruel cross of Calvary. You know, I want to look at the attributes of Jesus' heart as, as, as within, he's, he's in this morning as we look at that, he's, he's within 24 hours of the cross. 24 hours he's going to give his life on the cross for the sins of mankind. You know that a lot had to be going through his mind right now. He knew that he was going to be arrested. He'd already told his disciples that over in Mark chapter 9, verse 33 and 34. He'd already told him that they're going to be, that he's, going to, he's going to be arrested and into the hands of sinners. They're going to put him to death, and three days later he's going to arise again. But they didn't understand what he was saying. But they're getting ready to understand what he was saying. Because he's getting ready to die voluntarily on the cross for a sacrificial, as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind. And he knows he's going to do that. He knows the scourging's coming. That a man hardly ever makes it past a scourging. A scourging was, according to the writings of Josephus, was one of the most, was one of the most violent, violent things that can happen to a person. They take the cat of nine tails and they would, they would tear the flesh out of, a, out of a criminal that was laid across a rock, stretched forth. And a lot of times the kidney would be hanging out of the kidney cavity and he would be, still be alive, but no, most, most criminals never made it past, never made it past the scourging, much less the crucifixion. He knew he was going to go through both, and he knew he was going to die on the cross. He already had it all planned out. He knew he was going to fulfill Isaiah. He's gonna, he knew he was going to fulfill all the prophecies that came with that. He already knew that. So he had a lot on his mind. Would you say amen to that? A lot of you come in this morning with a lot on your mind. A lot on your mind this morning. I want you to know that your answer is Jesus this morning. Amen? And I want to give you four things to think about as we look into the Word of God today that we can use for an example as we look into Jesus' life this morning, as we look into the attributes of His heart. And I can tell you that, that even though He's 24 hours from the cross, I can tell you that His mind is on finishing what he started and that's that's when he died on that cross that we would have a way to be saved 
He's going to finish. Number one this morning, I want you to look at the servant's heart as Jesus is in the upper room. And I want you to see now with me in verse 1 this morning. It says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, he had mentioned that many times, my hour has not yet come. His hour has now come. He's within 24 hours of dying on that cross. He's within 24 hours of being beat brutally. That's before the scourging, and that's after. He says, the hour had come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want you to see this morning about the servant's hearts of Jesus this morning. And us as Christians, we are to be Christ-like. That means we ought to have the same attributes that Jesus has. And he, he had a servant's heart. And I can tell you, I never had a servant's heart until I got saved. It was always about me's heart. That's what it was always about. It was always about me. But I tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes in, something's going to change. And you become a servant. And Jesus is in the upper room where he's going to be, where, where a lot of things are going to take place there. But I want you to look that he has, in verse 1, he has a heart of love. He loved his own in that which was in the world. You see that on verse 1. And he also said he loved them and to the end. You know, even, even the disciples would leave him and one would betray him, but he loved them to the end. And when he says to the end, you're probably thinking to the end of some kind of, kind of point, but it means he loved them to perfection. That's the way Jesus loves, amen? Love is an attribute of Jesus' heart. Love is an attribute of a real born-again Christian that has a love for others. And, and, and we need to understand that today. You know, Jesus said in, in, in uh, verse 34, he said, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, by this, by this shall all men know that, that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Love carries a lot of weight. You know, we can condemn, we can, can judge and do the things that we shouldn't do because they're easy because we, we walk in the carnal flesh. But I can tell you, when the Spirit of God leads you, you've got a heart of love. And we need to understand that today. It says over in, chapter, in John chapter 15 and verse 9, Jesus said, as, as, the, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. It says in verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide, you shall live in my love. And even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, abiding in his love, abiding in God's love is a good thing. In chapter 15 and verse 13 and 14, he says, Great, greater love has no man to this than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command thee. I'm going to tell you this morning, church, we need to understand that Jesus, that Jesus had a servant's heart. And he served other people. And if when you've got a servant's heart, you, you're not going to have any trouble expressing how you love them too. And we need more love in our hearts instead of more anger in our hearts in this day and age in which we live. 1 John 3, 14 says, we know. I love how John writes with certainty. Here I am preaching out of the book of John, John the Apostle, and in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 that John wrote, we know, I love his certainty, that we have passed from death unto life. We have passed from a devil's hell to the eternity of glory because we love the brethren. See, that's an attribute or a characteristic of a Christian. He that loveth not his brother abides in death, and you're in trouble this morning. So we need to understand that love is important this morning. Love is an attribute of, of, of Jesus' servant heart, and it's an attribute of a Christian that has the, has the, has the Holy Spirit, and it's a, part, it's a part of a servant's heart. Love is. If you're with me this morning, say amen. amen. But I want you to see something else this morning in verses 2 through 5 because a servant's heart of humbleness is who Jesus is. 
He's humble. And we also live in a day and age where nobody's humble. Matter of fact, the arrogance is a part of our DNA today, and it's dangerous. I can't watch a football game without, I mean, they could be 18, they could be 25 points behind, but if they sack somebody, they, they act like they just won the Super Bowl. I mean, arrogance is a bad thing. I'm thinking, look at the score clock. Amen. Because it's all about people. It's all about them today. But I want you to know, I want you to look at the servant's heart. Look at verse 2 of our text this morning. And supper being ended, and the, devil, and, the, and the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and he went to God, it was all finished. He finished the race. Here, he's going he's gonna to complete the mission. He's going to go to the Father in heaven. He rises from the supper table and laid aside his garments and took a towel and he girded himself. Now, that's, that, that, this, is, this is something we need to look in on. Now, now only, only the person that would wash somebody's feet that would do what Jesus is doing, it, is, it would be the bond servant of the house. Well, what's the bond servant? Well, back in that day when, when there was, when they did have slaves, the slaves, after they fulfilled their commitment of being a slave, they would be released. And they had the option, if they wanted to, they could have stayed at the same home and served their master out of a heart of love instead of ownership. That's what a bond servant is. And see, Jesus became a bond servant right here. Out of the heart of love he had for his father and had a heart of love he had for us. After he poured water in a basin, he began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now notice that this morning. He took that role upon himself. And I, I want you to know that Jesus didn't come to be served. Jesus came to serve, which is our example today. Look down with me in verse 6. Then comes Simon Peter. Now you know something's fixing to happen here. Whenever Simon Peter rolls up, something's fixing to happen. Amen? I hate to tell you this, but I can relate to him. Have you ever inserted your foot before you should have in your mouth? Amen? That would be Peter. Here comes Peter. I hate to tell you, but I, he, might be, he might be my brother. He says in verse 6, Then comes he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, do, you, do thou wash my feet? Well, they couldn't understand this. This was a big deal to them. That Jesus would do something a slave would do, a free slave. There's just, it, was, it was underneath them to do that. It was underneath them to do that. They look down their long nose at somebody like that. Anybody home this morning? That was beneath them. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest not now, but, but you'll know hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. That's a, that was an absolute never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I wash not, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now Jesus is getting ready to show him. He's getting ready to teach him something. Amen? Now, now Peter's thinking about him washing all of him, literally, with water. Amen? It's not what Jesus is talking about. And he says in verse 9, then Simon Peter said unto him, well, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. I love verse 10 this morning because he says this. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean everywhere, and you are clean, but not all. I want you to really focus in on that and hear what he's saying this morning. 
He that is washed, he's talking about being saved, needeth not to be to wash his feet, but is clean everywhere. Jesus is making reference to what Peter said in verses 8 and 9. And his disciples were watching. Here's what he was saying. Here's what Jesus was saying to Peter and the disciples. He that is washed, he that is saved, needs not to be washed again. But the part that is in the world, that dirty part, the feet, your sin, needs to, that's the only thing you need to wash. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, how do you do that? Well, when you're saved, you're saved. Amen? If we have to get saved every time we sin, then we'd get saved about 20 times a day. And then if you have to be baptized to wash away your sins, which that's not what that's about. If you believe that baptism is a part of salvation and it, that it cleanses you from your sin, then you better just keep your bathtub full. Because you're going to wash, you're gonna have to take about, three, about eight baths a day. Y'all with me? Amen. So if, if water saves you, time, time you get baptized and you pull the plug, your salvation goes down the drain with the water. You have to start all over. See, it don't work like that. When God saves you, he saves you. But then we sin, don't we? And see, what he's talking to him about is your feet that's in the world. That's the only thing you need to be washed. Your sin. How do you do that? By confession. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to get saved again. Amen? Amen. Did I make that too simple? Jesus made it simple. And I want you to know today that, that if you're saved, you don't have to get saved eight more times. God saves you. He redeems you. He, he declares you righteous. He clothes you in His righteousness. Yeah, we're going to live for him. Yes, I don't want to sin. But do I sin? I sure do. And when I do, I get highly upset at myself. And I have to ask for forgiveness. I have to get it off my mind and my heart pretty quick. Because it'll slip up on you, won't it? And you think, boy, you would think at 67 years old I'd be smarter than that. But sometimes I'm just not. And neither are you. But I can tell you, I don't want to sin. When I was lost, I didn't care if I sinned. I just didn't want you to know. I didn't want to get caught. Bunch of holy people in here, ain't it? But when I got saved, I, now I don't want to sin no more. But when I do, I get frustrated. That's all I'm going to say about it. I'm like Forrest Gump. That's just all I'm going to say about that. Amen? Is that too simple for y'all? I know that's not theological, but it's good. It's good doctrine, amen? So I want you to see this morning that, that Pete, Jesus answers the question. And he, and, and he comes with a heart of humbleness, unlike Peter, unlike James and John that was arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom during this time. See, he knew they had a competitive spirit. And Jesus was teaching them to wash one another's feet just like he's doing. Amen? But you know what? It's always about us, isn't it? You know, it's amazing how we think we're servants of God, but we put everything else in front of him. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, we, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. Don't care anything about being in the Word. Don't care anything about being in prayer. Don't care anything about loving the brethren. Don't care anything really... If I just go to church about twice a month, I'd be okay. If I, if I, oh, I'd like to, yeah, I'm a Christian. But then we, then we teach our, everybody around us, whatever we're involved in, you, you got to give it all you got. Give it a hundred percent. Don't we? Commitment. Give it all. 
But you don't give nothing to Jesus. And he saved you. He died on that cross. And I want to tell you something. When you reflect upon that on what he did, we're pretty insignificant. But we think we're pretty significant in this day and age. I want you to see something this morning. That Jesus was humble. He wasn't arrogant. I want to tell you something. Arrogancy has overtook this world. And I'm not going to sit here and camp out on it. But I can tell you people are self-sufficient today. And I can tell you we're not self-sufficient. We need Jesus every day in our lives. Every day. Now I want you to look at the third thing this morning. Remember number one. Jesus is in the upper room. He has a servant heart. Remember number two, he has a servant heart of humbleness. Number three this morning, Jesus' servant heart, his love overcomes betrayal. Y'all ever been betrayed? Oh, Jesus has. Look down with me in verse two. He says, and, and supper being ended, the devil now having put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Notice that this morning. Look in verse 10, that last part of it. And you are all clean, but not all. That's what Jesus said. What is he talking about? He's talking about Judas. Look in verse 11. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Now let me tell you about Judas. Judas was a treasurer. Judas was a disciple. He was just like the rest of them. He looked like the rest of them. He smelt like the rest of them. He acted like the rest of them. He even, had, he even had the same verbiage as the rest of them had. He was just like the rest of them, except he was not a believer. He didn't believe in Jesus. Well, he believed in that bag he carried full of money. I say it was full of money. I'm just giving you an analogy. I don't know how much money was in the bag, but he carried it. And it also said in another gospel that he took the money that was in the bag because he was a thief. Look down with me in verse 18. And it said, I speak not of you all. I know who I have chosen, but that the scripture may be, be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Talking about Judas. You see that? You see how that's wrote? He has lifted up his heel against me. That's a picture of... It's in the Irish tense. It's a picture of a horse that kicks them. You ever been kicked by a horse? I have. It hurts. I'm just glad he did only kick me before it didn't hurt. I mean, they kick you in the head. You're in trouble. Amen? Well, I probably wouldn't be. I'd probably be better. Kick my head. It's hard. But a horse kick is pretty hard, ain't it? You think Jesus wouldn't you think that didn't affect him? That one of them is going to betray him? Matter of fact, John 6, 64, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Look down with me in verse 27. And after the sop, Jesus entered into, G into Judas and, and, and then said Jesus unto him, that that thou doest do quickly. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to betray him. You know why? You know how come that the devil entered into Judas? Because he didn't have the shield of faith. Do you know? Uh, Do you know today the Holy Spirit that enters our life and enters our heart today? Did you know that Satan can't enter our, our enter into a believer's heart? Amen. But he can stand outside and talk to you a little bit. He'll control you if you let him. That's him calling right now. <laughs> Maybe Jesus will call in a minute. He'll talk to you. He'll get right up on that head too. Get right up on that ear. That's why in Ephesians 6 it tells us to put the helmet of salvation on. Where's the helmet go? Over the head. Because he'll get in your head. You ain't really saved. If you was really saved, you'd 
you do this, you wouldn't be doing that. You know you're not real. What are you doing teaching Sunday school? What are you doing being a deacon? What are you doing being a preacher? You're lost. Y'all ever hear that? Oh, he'll talk from outside, but he can't get you here. Amen? Now, you that's lost, he can get you. He can get in your heart, he can get in your mind, and he'll control you. And he'll guide you. Y'all with me? I want to tell you about this. I want you, I want you to look down with me in verse 12 this morning. Because Jesus, Jesus, the servant's heart, love overcomes a betrayer. He loved him anyway. He loved Judas. The fourth thing this morning, Jesus is a humble servant. He's an example for us. He's an example. Look down with me in verse 12. He says, so after he had washed, his, washed their feet, he had taken his garments and was set down again and said unto them, Know you not what I've done to you? He asked them a question. Remember, they, they had a competitive spirit. You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. Let me ask you something this morning. Is he Master and Lord of your life? Is he? If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also to wash one another's feet. Or we, we are to be just like him. For I have given you an example that you should do as I've done. You see, he gave, he gave the greatest example that we should wash one another's feet. In verse 16, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. I can tell you, you can see Jesus' humbleness right here, and you can see that Jesus gives us an example to be humble and to do what he does. Can you wash your enemy's feet? Jesus did. Can you wash your betrayer's feet? Jesus did. Can you love your enemies? Jesus did. Can you pray for your enemies? Jesus did. Can you do good to your enemies? Jesus did. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid we've got a lot of Judases in Christianity today. They're all good as long as the money's coming in. But if the money quits, then they're not good anymore. Well, the money quit for him, and you know what? You know how much he gave? You know how much he betrayed Jesus for? 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. That's all he valued Jesus. That, that's the value he put on Jesus, a price of a slave. What's your value to Jesus this morning? What do you put the value to him on this morning? When you serve him, what's your value out of servitude that you serve him? What's your value when you serve his people? What's that value? We all put a price on what we're going to do for the Lord. We, got, we know how far we're going to go. Jesus went all the way. He went all the way to the cross. If you'll come back tonight, you'll see even how further, how much further he went to the cross for our sin. Yet we just give him this much time. We give him this much attention. We give him this much, we give our, we give our families this much discipleship. We talk more about what we're going to do tomorrow than what Jesus did for us. And we decide, as we should disciple our kids, we're talking about what we're going to do tomorrow. Why? Because our minds are selfish. It's about us and not about him. 
Amen? You know who Jesus is concerned about this morning? He's concerned about you. He's concerned about that one that comes in that his heart's been ripped out. He's concerned about you this morning. That's why he came. He's concerned about the one that's going through some financial pressures that nobody else understands and nobody else knows about. He's concerned about you. There's people in here that's had a lost loved one, but he, their, their hearts are ripped out. He's concerned about you this morning. That's why he came. To give you a hope and a future. We don't give people time of day that go through that. We're not sensitive to other people's needs. Why? Because we're not washing their feet. You wash your feet, you're going to get to know them. And sometimes too well. I'm one of those pastors that get in. I, I'm, I'm with you. And when I can't be with you, I'm tore up about it. I'm, not, I'm, one, I'm, I'm a hands-on pastor. I'm not one of the pastors from afar. I know what goes on most of your lives today. Because I'm with you. And I know your hurts and needs because I am with you. But you can't, you can't understand people if you, don't, if you don't wash their feet. The example. Y'all know it's a metaphor, don't you? I've never washed anybody's feet. Literally. But there was somebody that was, odd, when I, it was at odds with me. And I stood my ground on what the scripture said. I stood my ground. And it wasn't ugly. I just stood my ground. That's what the word of God says. This is the direction I'm heading. This is what it, I'm not, I'm not deviating from what the word of God says. And we had, we had a conflict. go to the door it's the person I'm having a conflict with I said, can I come in yes sir come on he brought in a bag and I sit down in my chair he got down on the floor I thought what's this nut doing no I didn't think it Then he took my shoes off. And he pulled out, out of this bag, he pulled out a, a thing of warm water and he pulled out a basin, pulled out a towel, pulled out a rag, and he washed my feet and apologized to me. I thought he's the bigger man. You know what? We're better friends today than we've ever been. I've got a respect for him. I've never done that to anybody. But he did. And it made a difference in our relationship. I stood my ground. I did what was right, but he was the bigger man. He handled it better. Amen? Amen? He handled it in humbleness. I'll always admire him. I'll always support him. But you know what? People can't do that today. They can't admit they're wrong, much less wash somebody's feet while they're doing it. Nobody wants to be wrong. But yet if you examine yourself, most of the time when you're in conflict, you, you, you play a part in it. You may think you're on the receiving end of it, but you might have had a little offense on it too. Amen? Amen. We can't admit that in this day and age. But we need to. You know the rapture can happen at any time. Praise God.
And then after seven years, here comes the millennial reign. That's going to be a good day. I mean, it's, heaven's, I mean, heaven's great, amen? The millennial reign of Christ is going to be awesome. Because when you turn the TV on, you watch the view, and you think, I can't stand that program. The, there will only be Christians here in the millennial reign. And you turn it on the view, and it's all Christian view. You can sit and watch. Everything's Christian. Amen? Amen. It's going to be good. And heaven's going to be better. Amen. I don't know how I got off on that. Yeah, I know how. I watched David Jeremiah this morning. I would encourage you to watch him. But I want you to know this morning that God has, Jesus has a servant heart. And that's what he wants for us this morning. And that person sitting right beside you, their hearts may be ripped out this morning. God cares about that. What Baptists do, they major on the minors and they minor on the majors. You know it and I know it. It's about others. That's what Jesus was about. He's about others. We're going to have a time of invitation this morning. Maybe we just all need to look at our hearts this morning. As we go into time of judgment house when people come in, it's not about a hash brown casserole over in the next room. It's about that person that comes in that lost his daddy. It's about a person that came in and lost his daughter. It's about the person that came in that been sexually abused, physically abused, verbally abused, and had about seven stepfathers. It's about them. It's not about us. It's about others. We get our mind on others this morning. Get our mind on Jesus. Get our mind on others. Lord, we come to you this morning. I've said everything you want me to say, Lord. I pray this morning for this, as we go into time of communion next Sunday, we reflect upon your broken body and your blood sacrifice.